Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. One particular genre in the Korean musical tradition is pansori, a form of storytelling typically performed by a singer and a drummer. <laughs> Pansori can be traced back to shamanistic practices and was only formalized and given its name in the 18th century during the Choson dynasty. A key element of contemporary renditions of pansori is the expression of Han, a sentiment of pain or lament that many consider unique to the Korean national psyche. In this episode, we had the privilege of interviewing Professor Heather Willoughby, who has extensively researched the spirit of pansori and what she calls the sound of Han. We talked about the origins of this vocal tradition, how one becomes a pansori singer, and of course, the relationship between pansori and Han. Heather Willoughby is Associate Professor at the Graduate School of International Studies of Iwa Women's University. She received a master's and doctoral degrees in ethnomusicology from Columbia University. Professor Heather Willoughby, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be interviewed by you. What brought you initially to Korea? I first came to Korea in 1986. In fact, I realized just the other day that it was 30 years ago, and that's a little frightening. But nonetheless, I actually came as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so I lived here for a year and a half at that time. And that was my first introduction to Korea and Korean culture. Why did you decide to focus your career on traditional Korean music, and especially why Pansori? When I was here in Korea in 1986, I had the distinct pleasure of going to a concert, and I had no idea what it was. When I went, or even afterwards, I didn't know that it was pansori. I later learned that it was, but much later. But it was a really remarkable experience. I went to this auditorium, and again, this was the 1980s, when there were a lot of political disputes, and I wouldn't call them riots, but there were certainly demonstrations at the time that were quite common. But what was also common before those demonstrations were essentially concerts or kind of play to get people excited about what was going to be happening. And on one of those occasions, a pansori singer was performing, and one of my friends thought that I would enjoy it, and so she invited me to it. And I was completely mesmerized by what I heard and what I saw, and was completely engaged in this. As I said, at the time, I had no idea that it was pansori. I knew that it was sort of storytelling. I had not been here very long. I'd been here less than six months, and so my Korean wasn't really good enough to understand much of the story. I got a little of it. I won't go too much into what happened, but just to say that it really made a great impact on me. After that, I go back to the United States after a year and a half. I return to the States, and I finish my degree in music, and I work for a few years as an elementary school music teacher, and then I want to go to graduate school. And so I start looking for schools, but really what I wanted to study at that point was music therapy. So as I'm looking for music therapy schools, then I come across this word, ethnomusicology. And I think to myself, I have no idea what it is, but that is my destiny. Because I thought, I can study Korean music. And ever since I'd been in Korea, that's what I'd wanted to do. And so I looked for schools. I ended up being accepted at a school. And so I went to Columbia University for my graduate degree. And there were lots of different things I wanted to study. I was still very much interested in the idea of of healing in music. And so I had thought somewhat about studying shaman rituals and the role of music. But eventually, two things happened that I think I'll explain a little bit more in, in detail later. But the one, I just realized that I really wanted to study Korean music, more specifically traditional music. 
And then in time, that narrowed down to Pansori. So once again, a very long answer to your question. What is Pansori and how would you describe it to someone unfamiliar with Korea? Well, a lot of people have asked that question, like, what is Pansori? And back in 1963, a group of scholars and singers and everyone got together and asked that very question. And they came up with things like, it's Korean opera, or it's Korean storytelling, it's poetry, it's sung storytelling. And they came up with all of these things, and in the end, they said, Pansori, Pansori Ita. So, Pansori is Pansori. And uh, that was their answer. So what is it? It's all of these things. I always say, at least, that it is a narrative, epic storytelling genre. It's epic, it is big, it's long. The stories that are told, if they are sung in their entirety, can last anywhere from four to eight hours. And it's not usually performed that way, but it can be. There is song. There are very kind of simple gestures or acting. And there is intoned speech. In that way, it's sort of like opera in that there is something that is sort of like recitative. It's not speaking like I am now, but it is intoned speech. And that is interpolated then with the singing and, as I said, simple gestures. So normally then, there is one person that is singing and one drummer. And the drummer plays the rhythms, but also does other key component, which is what's called twimse. And twimse is calling out words of encouragement. And so they'll say, chota, ushigo, way to go, good job, keep it up. And, and sometimes they'll, they'll even interact a little bit more with the singers. And so in general, again, the most basic form are just these two performers. In its original form, was Pansori performed exclusively by professionals, or was it more of a folk tradition? There's a couple different ways to look at this. If we look at the way in which Pansori developed, it was very much a folk idiom. And it came kind of out of two traditions, most likely. I mean, again, there's a lot of debate about this, but I'll go with this version that says that it came part from the shamans, and part from male traveling troops. So if you listen to contemporary shaman rituals, it sounds very much like Pansori in the storytelling almost. But then also from kind of these male performers that were often relatives of the shamans, then you get other ideas of sort of improvisation and control of the audience, getting the audience involved. I talked about twimse that the drummer is doing, but the audience would also participate with this twimse as well. And so in that way, it came out of folk roots. But perhaps we could say that by the time Pansori really became a notable genre and wasn't necessarily called Pansori at that time. Once it becomes a distinct genre, it is being performed by semi-professionals, if not professionals. And so in a way, I think that we can say that it's both. It's coming from folk roots, but it takes a great deal of mastery that the average farmer isn't necessarily going to sing. Nonetheless, there are Again, folk songs that, that are brought into Pansori tales and a lot of folk elements, especially the storytelling itself. Originally, the, the stories really were, were folk stories. When was that? When did it crystallize in a form that we can now recognize as Pansori? Well, that's another good question. See, you're, you're full of good questions. Let's see if I have any good answers. It's a little hard to say, and one of the reasons for that is because since it was being performed among the folk and by the folk, the folk were illiterate. And so they're not writing histories about Pansori. They're not writing down who are the singers and what are the stories that they're telling. And so it's not really until the 18th century that we begin having the literati those that can read and write, the elite, become more interested in the genre, and they then begin writing the histories and make other changes as well to the genre. But I believe it was 1788 that the first 
story about Pansori was written down, and it was actually by a Chinese emissary. You mentioned that Pansori was folk music for the folks, but did the court, did the Yangban ever listen to it prior to the 18th century? I don't know that we really have an answer to that. We certainly know that the Yangban began listening to it in the 18th century and began influencing it to a great deal. But it wouldn't surprise me in some ways if it was being performed not as court music, certainly not as part of the traditional court genres, but were there Pansori singers that occasionally sang for the court or for at least for the elite? I, I think that's certainly a possibility. So what are the key components of Pansori, the key characteristics? I mentioned before that there were a couple things that made up Pansori, and so let me let me tell you about those. So again, the first that we have, perhaps is most important, but it, but it all goes together. Each component is important. The first is Chang, and Chang means song. And so we have the songs themselves. And when we, we think of songs, if we think of Western opera, we think of very distinct songs, arias and duets, and they're composed with distinct melodies. Although in Pansori, the songs, of course, do have melodies, the songs may sound very similar to one another. And so in each of the Pansori tales that are sung, there's certainly distinct melodies. There's, there's very well-known pieces that are often repeated. But I think for a Westerner in particular, they may not be able to walk away singing part of this. It, it's not the same type of melody that we might think of in the West. But nonetheless, the Chang is important because it is a sung portion. The next portion is Aniri. And Aniri is the recitative part. And a lot of times what happens is the plot of the story may move along or key components be spoken of during the Aniri section and then expounded upon or beautified in some ways during the song. So those are the, the two main parts. And then you have the Norimse, and that's the actions. And again, when we're talking about action, we're not talking about broad acting, again, in maybe a Western sense. But the performer will have a fan and sometimes a handkerchief, and that's it. That's all the, the props that there are. And so that fan will open and close, and that opening and closing actually adds a very important component to the oral landscape. It's not just random. It's when you open that fan, it really, I mean, you hear it, and it, it snaps, and, and you have sudden attention paying to that thing that they're talking about. You also sometimes, the, the performer will use the fan, for example, in one of the stories, they're opening a gourd with a saw, and so they move that fan as if it's the saw opening the gourd. But other than that, there's not a lot of action per se. And the other component that I talked about before was the chuimse, the calling out of encouragement by both the audience and the kosu, or the drummer. At one point, a poem was written about, and this is, again, how we know something about the singers. They were called Kwangde, and we know something about the Kwangde because of this poem. And in that poem, the, the author talks about some other components also, besides just the Chang and the Norimse and all of that. So one thing that he talks about is Inmul. And this basically comes as good features. Are those good features meaning that the, the singer had to be good looking? Well, it's part of that, but it's part the presentation. The singer has to be very charismatic. And as I said, when I very first saw Pansori, the thing that drew me into this remarkable woman who was singing was her charisma. And so much so that at first I was sitting in the very back of the audience and I had to move up to the stage and I, I moved up to the side, but I was quite literally drawn to her and other people were as well, but I physically moved into her presence because I was so enamored by what she did and the way that she sang. And so that good feature is part of that. 
There's also Sasol, and that's the narrative. That's the story itself that's being told, and those narratives are folk tales. But it's also likely that at one point, as I said, in kind of the development period where it was just sung among the, the folk, it's quite possible that lots of different things were sung about, maybe more just about farming. Maybe they weren't intact stories the way that we think of them today. Are there different schools of Pansori, different branches? Originally, there were at least three different schools. And so you had Sopianje, Dongpianje, and Chungoje. And basically that means the Western school, the Eastern school, and the middle school. And that division was along Chirisan in North and South Chola province which is the most southern portion of Korea, which is where this developed. So these schools initially had somewhat different sounds to them, different ways of storytelling, and they also used different modes, and the modes being somewhat like a scale. Some emphasized one or the other a little bit more, and so they, they definitely had different sounds in the beginning. Today, that doesn't exist in quite a strict of a manner. And for one thing, the singers are not coming primarily from that area of Korea anymore. They're coming from all throughout South Korea, at least. And so that that's one thing that has changed that Dong Pianjie and So Pianjie. And the, the other is that over time, it's really just become melded together. So, for example, the first performer that I saw, and I'll talk a little bit more about her later, I think, was a woman by the name of Kim So-hee. And Kim So-hee originally studied with a man named Song Man Gap. And so she learned a particular style of pansori that had been passed down from his grandfather. But eventually, she studied with another performer as well who came from a different style. And so when she learned one of the tales, the tale of Shim Chong, she learned different styles, one more Song Pianjie and another Dong Pianjie. But her style then was to really put these together in the two different halves of the story. And so I think it's much harder today, even though there's still some differences and performers will say which, which school they are from. I would say that for the most part, that distinction is quite blurred now. You mentioned that Kim So-hee was trained by a man, but you also mentioned that there is only one singer normally. Are the songs gendered? That means are they parts for men and for women? This is something that's so fascinating to me. I wrote a, a conference paper one time, and one day maybe I'll publish it too, but it talks about pansori as the androgyny of sound. And the reason that I say that is because there is no distinct voice part. In the West, we have soprano, alto, tenor, bass. There's no such thing in pansori. And there, in fact, is no fixed pitch. So what I mean by that is maybe one day a singer has a cold. And so they can start singing at any pitch that they want. Everything is relative. They can start it at one pitch and then sing accordingly. But then another day, maybe their voice is very clear and, and they're feeling particularly good and they may sing a pitch or two higher than that and start singing there. They may even change in the middle of the extended story because there is no fixed pitch. And with that then, there is also no male parts, no female parts. In some Korean elite music, in some of the sung poetry, there are distinctly male songs and female songs, but in Pansori that doesn't exist. Anyone can sing anything. However, I will throw in here another answer to a question you haven't asked, and that is that originally it was almost all male singers, or at least, again, what we have record of. But then, again, in the 1800s, women began to be trained, and today the genre is dominated by women. Do we find Western equivalents to pansori, possibly singing or storytelling by bards during the Middle Ages? Absolutely. In many ways, Korea loves to talk about its uniqueness. And so it'll say that this is the only genre in the world like it. I mean, again, pansori, pansori ita. It just is what it is. And that's true to some extent. 
I've had many friends and family members that I have subjected to Korean pansori, and, and sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't, but they will always say that it's one of the most unique things that they have heard. And so, yes, in a way, there is something unique about the sound and about the storytelling. However, we certainly cannot say that storytelling is unique to Korea. There are many types of storytelling found all throughout the world, and storytelling that includes singing, and storytelling that includes drumming. And then one of the things you mentioned was the medieval bards, and in both France and and England that were quite prevalent. And part of what they did was they told stories, but they also brought in news. They were the newscasts of the day, and as they traveled around, they would bring news from the court to the common people. And I think that originally that's a lot of what Pansori did as well, is that maybe they had the skeleton of a story, but the guts and the flesh, how the story really came to life was by including current events or including the names of local magistrates and people that the local townsmen might know. And so, yes, there was a structure to it, but it was also storytelling. It was also the news. And so certainly they were like bards in that way. What are the classics of Pansori, and what are some of its masters? Once again, when we talk about the the classics of Pansori, we have to have somewhat of a different mindset than the West, where we might think of certain Baroque eras, and Bach being of the Baroque era, or W.C. in the Romantic era. And so we think of classics like that. But in Pansori... Today, we only have five classic stories that are retold, and they're told over and over and over by the different singers that are popular today. Originally, there were records that talked about 12 songs instead of just five, but even that is a little questionable because there are lists that list different sets of 12. There are key numbers that were in all of them, but there were also some different pieces also. And so eventually these 12 pieces, some kind of disappeared, some weren't of interest anymore. But I also talked about the influence of the literati. And one of the main things that the literati did was to expunge things that they thought were a little too lascivious, All of the Pansori tales, to some extent, mock the gentry a little bit, but they also glorify Confucian morals. And so the literati kind of cleared out some of those stories that didn't have a moral to them, a Confucian moral to them. And so when we talk about the classics, really it's the five tales. And so those five tales are Shimchonga, which is the story of a blind man and his daughter sacrificing her life for him and for his sight. The story of Chunyang, and that's the story of a young woman by the name of Chunyang, who really, again, dedicates her life for her love and sacrifices a great deal herself. There is Humbuga, which is a very well-known tale about two brothers. And then we have Sugunga, and Sugunga is a very comical tale, and it's about an underwater kingdom and the king is in need of some medicine and so a turtle has to go to land and fetch a rabbit and it's it's very humorous and then finally there's another story chokbyokka and that actually comes from a chinese war story so those are the five classics if you will what about some famous uh, master pansori singers Well, as as one would guess, there have always been master singers. There's those that sing, that enjoy it, but there are masters. There are the Pavarotti's of Pansori, if you will. And it's often divided into different eras. And so we have the eight master singers of the former period and the eight master singers of the latter period and then the five master singers of the modern period. And I'm not going to name all of those because it's names that you may never run into again. But there's a a couple important people, I think, that at least for, for me, 
Let me tell you a little bit more about my story, and then I can explain about masters from that. So, as I said, I first heard Pansori in 1986 and heard Kim So Hee. Well, it wasn't really until back in about 1999, when I was here doing my dissertation studies, that I learned that she was one of the great masters of the day, and she had since passed away, actually. But that when I heard her, even though she was older than, she was still a master. In fact, she had become an intangible cultural property holder, meaning that she was designated by the government as being a master. Well, what's interesting about that is when I then came here to study Pansori as an academic discipline, then I myself got a Pansori teacher because I I needed to learn something about how it's really performed, and so that was an important aspect of my studies. And so I met a young singer at the time by the name of Yi Ju Un, and she in turn studied with Shin Yong Hee, and Shin Yong Hee had learned from her father, but she had also learned from Kim So Hee, who had learned from Song Man Gap, who had learned from his father and his grandfather, who had learned from one of the, the first masters of Pansori by the name of Song Hung No. So there are these genealogies of Pansori that are very important. And to me, again, when I said that this was part of my destiny to study ethnomusicology and to study Pansori, when I found out that Yi Jun was part of this dynasty from Kim So Hee, it all fell together. And so there are great masters. So again, I mentioned that Kim So Hee was designated as an intangible cultural property holder. Well, since that time, Shin Yong Hee has also now been designated. And so Yi Jun, my teacher and good friend. Now, she has not been designated as the the holder, but she is essentially like one step away from that now. There's a series of steps that the singers go through. And so this is the the legacy of Kim So Hee. And if someone wanted to learn more and listen to Pansori, what would you advise him or her to listen to? What is a good introduction to Pansori? Well, there's, there's a number of recordings that can be found pretty easily. There's a few YouTube videos, and some of them are pretty good. Some of them are not so good. Interestingly enough, many of the great masters cannot necessarily easily be found on YouTube unless you know how to type in Korean. You don't necessarily find someone like Kim So Hee if, if you write it in Roman letters. Nonetheless, there, there are things, but there are some really great recordings out there, and there, there are some videos that can be had as well. And uh, there's a number of contemporary pieces as well, but if you are here in Seoul, then you can hear Pansori on a pretty regular basis. There is the Gungnim Gukak one, which is the National Gukak Center, and they regularly have traditional music performances, often including Pansori, and in conjunction also with the National Theater of Korea. And at both of those, occasionally you will get performances of what they call full-length Pansori. And so that can be anywhere from about two to six hours of Pansori. So there is a lot of Pansori going on. A term that came up in our previous interviews and also that we found quite a lot in your research is Han. What is Han? Han is an ineffable national ethos, as well as a personal sentiment, if you will. And because it's ineffable, I won't say any more. No, I will. I will describe to you what I, what I think it is. However, it's a really controversial term. I'll tell you what has been said to me, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the controversy. Once upon a time, when I was here studying Pansori for my dissertation, I was in a taxi and driving along, and, or riding, and the taxi driver said, why are you here? And I said, I'm here to study Pansori. And he said, oh, then you must know about the sound of Han. And that became the, the title of my dissertation. Because everybody at that time, and this was again in the 90s, made this correlation between Han and Pansori, as you mentioned. So what what is this Han? Well, as I said, it's a national ethos, in a way, of a nation who has suffered and who has experienced a great deal of pain and suffering 
generally at the hands of outsiders. But it's also a very personal sentiment or emotion, one of regret, one of, again, pain, of suffering, of lament. And it's important because, in terms of Pansori, because as I said, people often talk about this correlation. Where it gets tricky, however, is that where does this Han come from? Some people have said that it's it's almost innate in Korean. There's just this deep sorrow in people's minds and in their hearts, and that they, they have to, in some way, try to relieve that that Han, and, and that's part of the role of a shaman, but it's also the part of the role of Pansori in a way. But there are other people who claim that, no, this term never existed before the Japanese occupation. Others will say it never really existed before the Pak Chung Hee regime. And in both of those two instances, the argument is that it was used as a way to say the Korean people have been suppressed, and so I, Pak Chung Hee, or I, the Japanese Empire, am here to relieve that Han. And so, you know, you have to turn to me, you have to rely on me, because I'm going to be the one that relieves you of this. But the reason that that, that's so controversial then is it says that they're both imposing the Han, but also saying, I'm here to relieve you of that Han. And so whether Han is real or not has always been controversial. And yet I talk about it in my writing, in my dissertation and in my subsequent writing, in part because the people that I talk to, the Pansori singers and those listening to Pansori, say that it's real. And because it's real to them, it becomes reified. It becomes something that is real. Does one have to be Korean to get, to understand, to feel, to to exhibit Han? Many Koreans will say so. When I told them that I was studying Han, they're like, oh, you'll never really understand it. You can't understand it if you are not Korean. But a lot of other people, when they heard of my love of Pansori and of talking about Han, then they're like, oh, you get it, you you understand it. But I think one of the things that's most fascinating to me is to look at other musics and other music that expresses Han. And so I, I've never done this to the extent that I would like to, but one of the things that I would love to do is a comparative study with the African American blues for instance, where again you have a people of suffering and their musical expression thereof. And we can also look at the Portuguese fado, which is again just this remarkable music, but a lot of it is about sorrow, but it's about purging that sorrow. And so on the one hand, yes, Han is something unique to Koreans, or at least unique in the way that they perceive it, but I think it's also something universal in a way, and it's something universal that, that gets expressed musically in a variety of ways. Is Han something we can only find in Pansori, or do other types of Korean music also exhibit Han characteristics? I think it's most notable in Pansori, and that's because it's not just sung poetry, although there is poetry in Pansori, but it's the singing of one's life. So in each of the stories that I mentioned before, there are characters that are experiencing a whole range of emotions. Han and suffering is often at the heart of that. And so I think Pansori, more than other genres in a way, really expresses that. But both other vocal musics as well as instrumental musics in many ways have an expression of Han in them. I think, again, it's most notable in Pansori, however. And how about other forms of arts, uh, both in Korea and abroad? Once again, I think that we can see the expression of Han in many types of Korean arts. There are some modes of calligraphy, for example, that the scene itself may not be sorrowful, but there 
is a rawness perhaps to the brush strokes. And there are other types of calligraphy that are quite elegant. But maybe that is an expression of Han. We certainly see it in poetry. We see it in modern storytelling, in novels. And I think that it's quite present in many different forms of Korean life. In fact, going back to my early experiences, one of the reasons that I decided to study Pansori and Han specifically in Pansori is because I was attending a Korean traditional music school. It was specifically for foreigners. And the teacher one day was talking about the differences of sound. And he said that the sound of the folk was like the pottery of a kimchi pot. If you've ever touched a, a kimchi pot, it's quite rough and it's not elegant, but it's very useful. It's important, but, but there's a, a roughness to the pottery itself. And then he compared that with the music of the elite, which was like some of the great celadon pottery that also exists here in Korea. And was talking about those differences, and he also made an interesting comment. It was just kind of an aside, but he said, I wonder if the sound of Korean music is changing because people's life is not as difficult as it used to be. And because they're not experiencing as much Han, that the actual sound of Korean music is changing. And, and that just sparked an idea, and so that was the beginning of my dissertation. In a prior article, you wrote that there is also a notion among many Pansori performers that while there is a need to experience and reify the entire breadth of human emotion expressed with Pansori, many times the indigenous ethos of Han becomes emphasized. You're right in that the Pansori singers say that they have to understand the whole breadth of emotion. But I think Han is core because for me and for, I think, many Pansori singers, they will talk about the fact that Pansori helps in this idea of overcoming or the catharsis of Han. But in order to have the catharsis, one must truly experience that very sense of Han. And that certainly gets exemplified and over-dramatized, but nonetheless dramatized in, in a really powerful way in the movie So Pianje. And so I would ask your audience members to go and see that. It's an older movie now, but really terrific in talking about this correlation between Han and Pansori. But in it, a singer has to experience the Han in order to truly understand Pansori, in order to truly understand the entire Korean mindset. In practice, how does Han show itself in Pansori performances? So this is a, another part of Pansori that I studied quite a bit because I wanted to know, is Pansori just part of the storytelling? Are they just talking about sad things? Certainly there are laments in the Chang, in the singing portions. But what I found was most important is that Pansori in general uses a fairly harsh and raspy voice. But the more difficult the situation, the more lament, the more sorrow that the character is pouring out, that harshness becomes paramount to the singing itself. And they use something that in anthropology or in ethnomusicology we will call ritualized crying. There are times where it literally sounds like somebody is just pouring out their heart and crying, but it, it's very harsh, it's very rough. And so I think that is a physical manifestation of an inner turmoil. <laughs> For the most part, a Pansori singer will stand while they're performing, but there are times that they will kneel down. And that happens again in the particularly difficult periods where somebody is just pouring out their heart and their sorrow. And you may even see a performer just like 
on their knees, bending down to the ground, and they almost like just pound on, on the ground itself. When I was doing my dissertation studies in 1999, I spent a lot of time going to Pansori concerts, and I would often have my camera with me, and I took a picture one time of Ansuk San, another master singer, and she was kneeling down, but she, she had one hand on the drum, and the drummer was just leaning into her as if he wanted to help her relieve herself of this pain in some ways. But it is so powerful to have caught this moment of ultimate pain, of her just reaching out, you know, trying to relieve herself of the pain and the suffering that had accumulated over time. So yes, there are physical motions as well that the singer will go through in order to draw that audience into the Han and again to the catharsis of it. You wrote in the past that a core attribute, uh, as one strives to become a master of pansori, is dogem. Could you tell us more about it? I think all singers everywhere want to become a master of their art. But dogem goes beyond the mastery of sound. It's the mastery of mind and of body as well. True mastery of oneself. So dugam is a concept that is spoken of not only in pansori. I've heard it in other Korean music as well. But I think, again, it's something that often gets emphasized among pansori singers. And the idea is, is one of transcendence, almost. That it's not merely a matter of becoming a good singer, of having a good voice. Rather, it's a matter of mastering all of oneself one's emotions, one's life, one's spirituality. Let me read for you something that my Pansori teacher said, and she was preparing for a concert, a full-length version of the story of Humbuga, which again was the story of the two brothers. And this is what she said. In my 20s, I think I did not fully realize the real-life lessons portrayed in the Song of Humbo, because I thought I had expended enough energy to learn to sing pansori according to the dictates of my heart, and had already perfected the art of pansori that my master had taught me. In other words, I concentrated primarily on the skills, sound, and performance practices of pansori without internalizing the story's deeper and genuine meaning. In my 30s, however, I realized that I had to experience all of the same trials and joys that the characters in the Song of Humbu had endured. Thus, all the situations in the story have come to life for me. Their profundity moves me and brings me to tears. That, to me, is what Dugum is. Does that mean that there is a need for the Pansari singer to internalize Han, to live through life and accumulate this hand to be able to use it during recitations? I think that they would absolutely say so. As I mentioned before, this whole idea of Han is very controversial. The reason that I keep talking about it is because Pansori singers keep talking about it. And for them, it is very real. And I can't negate that. Whether it is a true national ethos or not, or where it came from, it's something that they believe in. And because of it, then then I believe it too, in that way. And it is something that they say that they have to experience that Han. They have to live through it themselves. Otherwise, there's no way they can really experience it. To me, is the, the difference between sympathy and empathy. It's like, I can sympathize with you if I see your suffering, but if I myself have suffered and I know what that suffering is, then what I can give to you is far greater. Does that mean there can be no young Pansori master? I think that there are great young Pansori singers, and they can bring a tremendous amount of vitality and life to the genre. But if you think about martial arts in East Asia, in almost every martial art, there are different levels of belts that you can get. And you can get a black belt, even when you're fairly young. But to truly have a mastery of that martial art, you have to master your mind. You have to master your body. And that does not happen for a 12-year-old or a 16-year-old. 
They may be very good, they may be nimble, they may be fast, but I think that there is something more profound than just the physicality of it. And I think it's the same thing with Pansori. Yes, there are going to be great singers when they're young. Again, my teacher was quite remarkable. She started singing when she was about seven and in a sense was a master at 12. But that mastery compared to where she is now or compared to where her teacher is in her 80s, those are very different things. And so to be a true master, to become a Myeongchang and designated as a Myeongchang, I think you have to experience life and all the parameters thereof. Traditionally, how did one start to learn Pansori? Before I mention the idea of the legacy of Kim So-hee, who had learned from Song Man Gap, who had learned from his father and his uncle and his grandfather. And so traditionally, most Pansori singers came from particular family lineages. And if they didn't come directly from a family, they again might be cousins or extended family, or also a student who might really, really want to learn Pansori, again, for instance, Kim So-hee, who didn't have a family member who was specifically a Pansori musician, she would then seek out a master and become an apprentice of that individual. And by that, I mean apprenticeship in the true meaning of the word. That is, you would often go to live with that individual and devote your life to that master singer until you yourself became a master and then would have students also. But it was a matter of not only learning to sing, but learning an entire way of life from that individual. But with that also sometimes came this experience of Han. This was not always easy. These are people who are practicing a few hours a day, maybe just one hour a day with the master, but then they would go off and practice by themselves for for eight or more hours a day, and sometimes, you know, causing damage to their vocal cords, and yet that damage is also part of that sound that I talked about, that harshness, that roughness, that is gained by sort of incessant practicing and uh, building calluses on your vocal cords, something that just make Western singers absolutely cringe, like you never want calluses. But but that's all part of the, the training. And so an individual might start out at a fairly young age. You might start out, I mentioned before, my teacher started singing when she was about seven, but really became more dedicated around 10 to 12. But often, once again, this involved becoming a literal apprentice of a master singer. What about now? Korea has quite a wealth of hagwons, of academies for music, for math, but are there pansori hagwons? There are, and I think you see some strains from tradition playing out now, but some differences. And so certainly a student is still going to seek out a master. However, I think it would be almost unheard of for that individual to go and actually live with the master teacher. Once again, I give the example of my teacher, Yi Joon, and she actually did go to live with Shin Young Hee when she was about 12 years old and once again became her apprentice. But I asked her just very recently, would a student ever do that with you today? And she said, absolutely not. It just isn't really done anymore. So a student will still seek out a master. It's very important. And and that's true if you look at a pianist or a singer in the West, they will list who their teachers are. That's, once again, legacy is very important. And so that's true among Pansori singers today. But as you said, there are also hagwons, or more specifically what will happen is that there are arts, high schools, and then colleges, universities, of course. And so most singers today will study with a master, but will also try to get accepted to the arts high schools and then go on and get maybe at least a bachelor's degree, sometimes a master or even a PhD in a particular musical tradition. Studying music, the piano, the violin, often carries a certain prestige with it. Is it the same for Pansori? Before I mentioned the fact that most Pansori singers today are women, 
And there's a couple reasons for that, and I won't go into the whole history of it. But one of the reasons was economic. At some point, it became almost impossible to make a living wage as a Pansori singer. And so men who had families simply couldn't afford to be a musician. So at the beginning of the 20th century, when there was an incursion of Western ideas and thoughts coming through Japan, but also just with the introduction of more Westerners in Korea, there was the introduction of Western music. And those who could afford a piano, that was real wealth. And so prestige came to mean not indigenous folk music, that came to be looked down upon, but rather it was the music of the West. And unfortunately, I think some of that carries on today, although certainly there is a resurgence of interest in traditional musics and pansori in specifically. I think that in terms of elitism, there is still a lot more of uh, prestige that is put on Western music masters than there are traditional music masters. Nonetheless, I think you see the government putting efforts in and society as a whole still maintaining this intangible property holder notion so that there are masters. And with that certainly comes prestige as well. But I think maybe not so much as Western music. Today, is Pansori a living tradition or is it more similar to an artifact in a museum that is preserved but not really innovated upon? I think it's both. With the inauguration of the intangible cultural property holding system that was established in 1964, that changed Pansori in some ways. If you wanted to become designated as a master, you had to sing it as the previous master did. What happens then is that a certain way of singing becomes the quote-unquote right way. But Pansori had previously always been an improvised genre. And so with this system, you begin to stagnate in some ways. As I said, there are the five Pansori tales that are told over and over and over. And one of the reasons for that is because that's the tradition, these five tales. So on the one hand, there is something of this somewhat staid artifact. Nonetheless, it's also very much a live, living tradition. You have all sorts of innovation that's going on. You have young singers that are creating new pansori tales, and sometimes they're just a short episode that will last five to 15 minutes long. But even so, they're beginning to expand that also. You have people that are making fusion pansori, that is creating pansori with maybe a jazz band in the back, or my teacher, again, Ijun, has, has created a really interesting album with a Russian pianist. But more than a lot of the fusion things that I've heard, I love this because he really gets pansori, and he's improvising himself, and so he's keeping things very fresh as she sings and he plays. And so, yeah, it, it's very much alive because there's a lot of great things going on. Back to the teaching of Pansori, what methods were actually used and are still used to teach Pansori to the students? In the past, everything would have been learned by rote. Nothing was written down. Again, we're, we're talking about this coming from a folk tradition, and as I mentioned, they didn't write, they didn't read, and so it was all done by write. I would sing a line or a passage, and you would sing it back to me, and then you would go off and work on that yourself. And so everything was done by, by rote. Later then, the texts were written down, and so people would learn still by rote, but also then at least have the text in front of them. Then you had recording devices. 
However, I will also say that as much as those recording devices and the writing and everything helps, the basic principle of learning pansori is still by rote. Even when I was learning from my teacher, she would sing a passage, I would repeat it. She would sing the next passage, I would repeat it. And then she would sing the, the whole section, and I would repeat it. And so that is still done today. And so again, technology certainly helps, but it has not supplanted the need for a master and learning with them. Are students expected to learn Han from their masters to attend Dogen from their masters, or is that a solitary pursuit instead? I think it's more of a solitary pursuit. They may experience life with and from the master, but Dugum is very much a solitary pursuit, so much so that in the past, performers would seclude themselves in the mountains, sometimes going to a Buddhist temple, sometimes some type of hermitage, or, or really just kind of out there on their own, in the mountains singing, practicing over and over and over, just on their own. Once again, Kim so he did that. She sequestered herself for almost seven years and she would come back into society. It's not like she was in the mountains that whole time. But still, that solitude is essential, I think, to understanding and, and coming to the point of dugum. But today, once again, maybe that's not as essential, but it goes back to this interesting point that I also think the sound of pansori is not as harsh as it used to be. And the very nature of pansori is continuing to evolve. How is Pansori faring today, and has it tried to adapt to new contemporary sensibilities? As I mentioned before, there's a lot of singers doing some really great things out there right now, really clever, comical stories and episodes. Uh, so yes, I, I think it is moving into a contemporary world. I, I think there's still, even in, in my classes, when I play music for the undergraduates and play Pansori, a lot of them have never heard it or have never attended any traditional music concerts. And so it's a little odd that I, as a Westerner, am coming in to tell them something about their heritage. But I will also say that all of them have loved it by the end, both the traditional and because I also want them to see the living tradition and see what's happening now with the fusion and with the contemporary tales. They're, they're really tackling new questions. I remember one story that I saw that was about a woman who had been raped, and it was one of the most moving Pansori episodes that I had ever seen. It was, it was really tragic, but they were able to use that genre to continue this story of Han, I think, and it was it was remarkable. In conclusion, you mentioned that as life becomes easier, Han is in some ways disappearing. Are you seeing Han evolving and changing to a new version of itself, or is it more, as you said, just a disappearance? I have not thought of that before. I think that maybe it's a, a new sense, because People are, are suffering maybe in different ways. I think not everyone in Korea, but the majority have food to eat, warm houses to live in, and certainly that's not the case for all. I don't want to negate those who do suffer in that way. But you have students who pour in all of their resources and their young life to go to school and then don't have jobs. They, you have people who are working 80, 90 hours a week. And so there, maybe the, the suffering is in a different way, but I think it's still there. If it's Han or if it's just a miserable boss, I'm not really sure. But I, I do think young people don't conceptualize Han in the same way as in the past, and yet it's still something that they're very aware of. And so I don't think that it has been negated or disappeared altogether, but I don't think it's on the national conscience anymore. On the final note, and this might be a bit out there, would you say that maybe as consumerism rose in Korea, features of Han that were visible and observable in Korean culture have become hidden? behind shiny toys, new phones, new cars, a very shiny K-pop. Is Han just hidden behind a new facade? I think that's quite possible. 
because it has been said that Koreans are very stoic, that they don't show their emotions. And yet, if you look at the individuals that are reunited with their family members in North Korea and then have to part again, you still, you hear that wailing, that sense of sorrow is profound. If you look at the tragedy of the Sewol ferry accident, you have national mourning. It's a very oral expression of Han. And so is it gone altogether? No, I don't think that it probably is. But are we better at hiding it? Again, in consumerism? Absolutely, I think that's true. Professor Willoughby, thank you so much for your time. It's been my pleasure. I'm glad to be on the, the pantheon of those who have been interviewed here, and I've enjoyed my time with you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.